denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. Civil rights bill that will destroy individual liberty and freedom in this country. I shall work to bring new industry into Alabama during my administration. I want to see a new plan in every city and town in this state within the next four years. Well, why don't you learn some other four-letter words, like W-R-K and S-O-A-P. You ought to learn those. You don't know those. The best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. I've climbed my last political mountain, but there's still some personal hills that I must climb. But for now, I must pass the rope and the pick to another climber and say, climb on. Climb on to high heights. Climb on till you reach the very peak. Then look back and wave at me. I too will still be climbing. A chapter in Alabama's history books coming to a close. George Wallace ending a political career filled with turmoil and tragedy. He's a man who could arouse emotions that few other Alabama politicians could generate. You either loved George Wallace or you hated him. There was no in between. And that was the way he wanted it. George Wallace was born August 25, 1919, in the small southeast Alabama town of Clio in Barber County. Clio is still a small town today. It's about an hour's drive east of Montgomery. There's still one traffic light, one cafe, one doctor's office. Things really haven't changed an awful lot here since George Wallace grew up during the Depression. That wasn't an easy time for anybody, including the Wallace family. Like any boy in the Depression of the 30s, we were poor and proud, and my mother today never would admit we were poor. We had a big garden in our little, uh, back of our house. We ate well, like all people white and black did to live in the rural areas, but uh, of course it, it died in the wintertime and sort of limited, you know, for the lack of uh, money to buy things to can in. Many of his friends and colleagues feel Wallace's humble beginnings shaped him into the man and politician he became. John Tyson was a Mobile County state senator during Wallace's first administration. George never did appreciate uh, money or wealth. He just as soon sit on a, uh, on a stool out here in, in Crystal and eat a, a crystal and, uh, and drink a uh, Coke or a root beer. Josephine Hall grew up with Wallace and Clio. There was no doubt in her mind what would become of him. When he was in uh, grandma school, he'd go around and ask everybody if they were going to vote for him when he run for governor. He had that in his mind from the time he was a small child until he, was, until he got to be governor. This is the house in Clio where George Wallace grew up. And this is where he got many of his political ideas. They came from his father and his grandfather who were very active in Barber County politics. To this day, Wallace remembers his father talking about the need to build more technical schools and the need to attract new industry. As a teenager, his father drove him to Montgomery where Wallace fought his way to become a Senate page. The job gave him an education into the workings of Alabama politics. I used to hear Senator Mike Rogers when I was a uh, uh, when I was a page in the legislature back in 1935. They elected pages then, and we worked full time. I was 14 years of age, and uh, I used to hear him say, "How long, how long will Mobile be the stepchild of Alabama politics?" The teenage Wallace put what he learned as a page to work back home as he campaigned and won election as president of his high school senior class. He was already developing he his political style. All, he worked for all of us. He tried to see that everybody was treated right and everybody had an equal chance in whatever they undertake to do. Athletics also became a passion in his life. Although he only weighed 98 pounds, he quarterbacked the high school football team to a 10-1 season. The little man who was to do a lot of fighting in his political life got an early taste of it as a boxer in high school and college. He won the bantamweight division of the Alabama State Boxing Championships as a high school senior in 1936 and kept the title the following year as a freshman on the University of Alabama's boxing team. Because his family wasn't rich, Wallace had to work his way through college. His odd jobs included selling magazines door to door, driving cabs in Tuscaloosa, and during the summers, helping out as a veterinarian's assistant. While here in Alabama, he actually became known as a campus liberal. 
He won the presidency of his freshman class by opposing the sororities and fraternities on campus as undemocratic. He felt they divided the student body along class lines and he wouldn't have anything to do with any of them. After graduating with a law degree in 1942, Wallace enlisted in the Army Air Corps. He fell in love with 16-year-old Lurleen Burns while she was working in a Tuscaloosa dime store. They were married while he was on leave. Wallace was assigned to a B-29 bomber squadron as a flight engineer, saw action over Japan, which caused him to lose some of his hearing. He returned home in 1945. And when I got... Uh uh, left out of the service in December 8th. I came right back to Mobile and hitchhiked the next day to, to Montgomery and saw Governor Sparks and he gave me a job of $175 a month. That job was as an assistant attorney general. A year later, he ran for the state legislature from Barber County and defeated two opponents. His reputation as a liberal on the campus of Alabama followed him into the legislature. One of Wallace's longtime friends and advisors, Jimmy Faulkner of Baymanette, remembers. They thought he was real liberal, and I think the reason for that was one thing, is trade schools. That was sort of a liberal idea to train people to work with their hands and so forth. But In 1947, under Governor Jim Folsom, Wallace introduced the Trade School Act. I had eight to begin with in the bill and thought that was so drastic they cut it to five. But I was a freshman legislator, 27 years age. I didn't get up and talk all the time on the microphone on every issue. So I wound up talking about that bill all through the legislature, and I got it through on the last night. Even though they considered it a radical thing to build five institutions at one time. He also pushed through what's now known as the Wallace Cater Act. It was an invitation for out-of-state industries to come to Alabama. A number of companies took up that offer, including Degusa in Mobile County. It offered a guarantee of municipal bonds and a promise of no property taxes for at least 40 years. Because of these radical pieces of legislation, Wallace became known as the number one do-gooder in the legislature. In 1952, he gave up his seat in the legislature, ran for judge in Barber County, and won. On the bench, he continued to build a progressive and liberal record in almost all issues, except civil rights. When it came to civil rights, Wallace was anything but liberal. In 1953, he became the first Southern judge to issue an injunction blocking the integration of local train stations, he opposed civil rights laws because he felt the federal government had no right to interfere in states' affairs. Wallace's attitude changed dramatically after his first run for the governor's office in 1958. He ran against John Patterson that year in the Democratic primary. They were the two leading contenders, and race was very much an issue. And John Patterson had the support of the Klan, and um, he was uh, the staunchest segregationist. Wallace had the support of the NAACP, he took a moderate stand on the issue of race. He defended segregation, but he refused to pledge any illegal resistance to federal court orders or to federal law. In that election, he took the licking of his life and lost to John Patterson by 65,000 votes. The loss to Patterson in 58 was a political awakening for Wallace. But after that race, Governor Wallace saw the circumstances that you, in order to be elected in the late 50s and the 60s, that you had to be a segregationist. And um, so I think he had, he never hated blacks. He never really, because he was compassionate toward them like he was all humans. But I think that he did realize that if he was going anywhere politically, and he is a political being, that he had to take a stronger stand on segregation. Wallace went back to fill out his time as a circuit court judge in Barber County with an eye on the 1962 primary. In 1959, he defied a court order to release voting records during an investigation of discrimination against blacks at the polls. I will not comply and I will not produce records as requested by this subpoena issued by the Civil Rights Commission here in Montgomery, Alabama. Wallace had earned a new nickname, the Fightin' Little Judge. He knew his resistance was hopeless, but it built him a lot of popular support which he would use later. In 1959, George Wallace was a private citizen once again, practicing law here in Montgomery and waiting for the next chance to run for governor. When 1962 rolled around, Wallace remembered the bitter political lessons he learned in the last election, and he took a strong stand in favor of segregation, promising to stand in every schoolhouse door in the state if he had to. His opponent in that election was former political ally Jim Folsom, who refused to be drawn in to the segregation debate. Wallace won that election easily, 
and when he took the oath of office in January 1963, he promised the crowd segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. With those words, Wallace set the stage for much of the racial unrest and violence that was to follow. Wallace also promised the state to fight desegregation, so when a federal court order came to integrate the University of Alabama, Wallace made his stand at these doors. Do the hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. Former state senator John Tyson. No one knows what his, uh, his motivation was entirely, but let me give you a very classic example that's never been written. Uh, he told me <clears throat> the day before he went over there, he said, sometimes in your position as uh, an elected official or in command, you have to act on what people are going to do or what they think, what, not whether it's right or wrong or what have you. Wallace made his one stand in the schoolhouse door and let that stand speak for itself. When the court order came to desegregate Murphy High School in Mobile, National Guard troops were brought in the night before Henry Hobdy and Bridget Davis were set to begin class. Then the next day, a call came from Washington taking control of the National Guard away from Governor Wallace. The school day proceeded without incident. But Wallace verbally fought the federal government every step of the way, showing the voting public he would stand by his promise. One of the people actively fighting Wallace's segregation stand at the time was the Reverend Jesse Jackson. But he lost every battle he fought. George Wallace could not stop people from desegregating schools. He could not stop public accommodations. He could not stop the right to vote. And one had the sense that deep down, he knew he could not. So at that level, one senses that he uh, really was demagogic, that he, he had his intelligence at one level, his behavior at another. He was, in a sense, using uh, people that believed in him for his own narrow political ends. Why did you take the stand you did on segregation way back when? Because everybody else felt and believed that 95% of the black, white folks in Alabama, 98%, that's what they believe. We lived in that thing, and we just took it for granted. But, uh, of course, uh, after the end of year 1963, I saw it would not work. What I'm trying to say is they believed at Mobile. You had to segregate the schools in Mobile. Seventeen states had them. Had them more than that back in the 20s. What I'm saying is we accepted that as a way of life. It was better for both races, we thought. But, of course, I found out, most Alabamians already found out, that is not the way we live. We cannot live divided and se segregated. His stand upset many back home in Clio, including Josephine yeah, Hall. It was, it was kind of kind of sad, but you know what? We all have to change. It was it was hard for us to uh, see him have to back down, but uh, we realized that uh, times were changing. Things was going to have to change, and I have never. I don't think George really ever felt towards colored people, had a, a real bad feeling towards colored people, but I think he just resented the fact that it was being pushed down on the southern people to have to take what, what, he had to, what we had to take. But uh, I think it's worked out real good. Well, it's just one uh, something that we had to learn to live with. And, but it, it was hard to take it first, to see him be done like he was done, but... Wallace's stand in the schoolhouse door brought him national attention, and in 1964, he decided to test the waters for a presidential run, challenging President Lyndon Johnson in Democratic primaries in five states and finding thousands of emotional supporters along the way. Civil rights bill that will destroy individual liberty and freedom in this country. All this while Birmingham police chief Bull Connor turned the fire hoses on nonviolent protesters, outraging the nation and the world. The state legislature in the meantime resented Wallace's power. When he asked the legislature to rewrite the state constitution to allow him to succeed himself, the members had had enough. They voted the measure down. But that didn't stop Wallace. He ran his wife, Lurleen, instead. Wallace did most of the campaigning for his wife, who was suffering from cancer. She went on to win the election by the largest majority in Alabama history, 63% of the vote. She was really governor. She naturally asked him a lot of things, uh, things that she was not acquainted with. But when it came down to final decision, shall we follow this road or that road, after she'd gotten all the facts and, and so forth, and maybe some of the facts came from him, and she, all, she listened to him. But in the main, she was governor. 
and I don't think he ever tried to pretend that he was. The term of Governor Lurleen Wallace lasted only 14 months. She died in her sleep, leaving Wallace without a wife and without access to the governor's office. But Wallace was able to bounce back later in 1968 and made his second run for the presidency. And as usual, his outspokenness drew both supporters and detractors. Well, why don't you learn some other four-letter words, like W-R-K and S-O-A-P. You ought to learn those. You don't know those. That's right. I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to drag you by the hair of your head and stick you under a good jail where you belong. You remember that? Running under the banner of the American Independent Party, Wallace won five states and finished third to Richard Nixon and Hubert Humphrey. But he knew if he were to make another serious run for the presidency, he needed a political office from which to mount an attack. And so he ran for governor again in 1970 and won a close battle with Governor Albert Brewer. Two weeks before his inauguration, he married Cornelius Snively, the niece of former governor Jim Folsom. By the time 1972 rolled around, he shocked the political experts by winning the Democratic primary in Florida and gaining an early lead over his challengers. His critics were stunned by his popularity, especially in the northern states. Ken Bode is NBC's national political correspondent and has covered politics for more than a decade. He was popular at that time because he was the first candidate, the first populist candidate to really gin up that anti-Washington, anti-establishment kind of uh, feeling in the country. He was a vehicle to send a message to the establishment. And he made fun of everything in a way that Americans, that some Americans really found very interesting uh, and very uh, appealing. Um, the pointy-headed briefcase toting bureaucrats from Washington, D.C., and when they open them briefcases, what do they have? Nothing but a peanut butter sandwich in those briefcases. Now, you've heard a lot of anti-Washington rhetoric, but nobody said it quite with the punch, the populist punch, and the sort of sneer on his face that George Wallace did. But his dreams of a presidency ended in a parking lot in Laurel, Maryland. Well, sure, I remember it, uh, other than I just went into this crowd, the Civil Service, uh, Secret Service said, uh, Let's go with the car, the fabric, very friendly. I said, I want to shake hands, shake hands, shake hands. So I threw my coat, Secret Service man. I stepped in the crowd, and as soon as I did, I had five, five like firecrackers. I said to myself, this is it. I didn't feel the bullets hit me, but I fell to the ground. I knew I was shot. And I knew I was paralyzed because one of my friends looked down and said, it's not bad, Governor, it's not bad, it's low. I said, well, you look again, Emmett, it's it bad. I can't move my feet, I'm paralyzed. And of course, after that, I nearly died. I was almost dead when I got to the hospital. One of the bullets that passed through Wallace's body lodged in his spine and left him paralyzed from the waist down. But he was able to recover enough to become the first Democratic candidate to address a national convention. A man we indeed welcome to this convention, the distinguished governor of Alabama, Governor George Wallace. There it is. The alternates are getting up, and lots of delegates are coming to their feet. As I left the hotel tonight, my daughter asked me, my young daughter, 11-year-old daughter asked me, Daddy, are you going to speak at a political rally? I told her, no, I'm not going to speak to a political rally tonight. I've spoken to one political rally too many already this year. We will never know what might have happened if Wallace had listened to his Secret Service agents and avoided the crowd in Laurel. Do you think you could have been president? Yes, I could. Sure, I do. I'll tell you one. But NBC's Ken Bode disagrees. Wallace would never have been nominated in 1972 because basically he had nowhere to go after Maryland. Wallace was really, was really pretty much finished in the Democratic primary process by the time he was shot. And in fact, the great suspicion was that Wallace would have run another independent party bid in the fall in 1972 had he not been shot. And, and that had the Republicans scared. Nixon's people were desperately afraid that George Wallace would run as an independent again in 1972. And if he had, he would have hurt the Republicans much more than the Democrats. When President Nixon was flying back from California in 1972, the day of the election, he was asked by the journalist Teddy White to name the most significant turning points in the campaign that led to his landslide. The first thing he said was the day Wallace was taken out of the race. But Wallace was also considering another political option at the Democratic Convention. In 1972, Hubert Humphrey and George Wallace had an understanding. 
that Governor Wallace was going to be the vice presidential nominee and Humphrey was going to be the presidential nominee. But things didn't work out that way, and Wallace returned home to Alabama to recover from his wounds and decided now is the time to change his political stands. In 1973, ten years after fighting the integration of the University of Alabama, he crowned the school's first black homecoming queen. Congratulations here, your mighty pretty queen. And by 1979, he had come full circle, admitting what some say he knew all along. He was wrong. I believed it was in the best interest of white and black uh, to be uh, in a segregated school system. But I was wrong. And once we lost the legal battles, I think we all saw we were wrong. I think that him getting up and saying that uh, that's the way I felt, but I was wrong, said it for everybody. I think his true self came out. He could see the changes in the, um, the electorate and the changes in the people, and he could safely, without fear of hurting himself politically, or, and more also that he could accomplish more by coming out, obviously, and being fair to everybody, which is really what he always wanted to do. I do not think that you could roll George Wallace at gunpoint in front of a schoolhouse door i get him to make a, a statement publicly that would be harmful to black people. I think the change has been just that profound. Ironically, some people even give him credit for preventing a bad situation from getting worse by taking his schoolhouse door stand. In all due respect to the gentleman, I, I don't think we ever duly gave him credit because it looked like such a demagogic thing to do, to go stand in somebody's schoolhouse door and say, you can't come in. But uh, with the things in Arkansas that had happened and the things in Mississippi that had happened, um, Iris came off uh, really without a hitch. There was a story right here in Mobile, and the man's still alive, that called into my office, or called my home really, and says, we have two companies of men with bazookas, with automatic weapons and everything. Where do you want them? We're ready to go to Tuscaloosa. And the only thing I could think of, and I had to think fast, it says, do you believe in George Wallace? Yes. You stand where you are, give me your number, and wait for his command. And they stayed here in Mobile. Now, Mobile, which was a very moderate sort of place, imagine what the rest of the state would have been. It would have been a wasteland. And so him standing in that door, while it looks rather foolish in our day and time, there was a lot of high feeling that had come up from the past, who knows where, that uh, he accomplished without any bloodshed. As Wallace was changing his stand on civil rights, one thing wasn't changing, his thirst for political power. Wallace ran for governor a third time in 1974, but his dream of the presidency wasn't over yet. But I am here in 1976 to take up where I left off in 1972. Here we go, White House, here we go! But the physical strength needed in a presidential campaign proved to be too much, and another Southerner, Jimmy Carter, outdistanced Wallace in key early primaries. After six years of marriage, George Wallace divorced Cornelia in 1978. The following year, Wallace left state office and worked for the University of Alabama at Birmingham. But his office was in Montgomery with a view of the Capitol, and he never lost sight of returning to power. I, George Carly Wallace, solemnly swear. Wallace came out of seclusion in 1982 with his new wife, Lisa Taylor, and went on to win an unprecedented fourth term as governor of Alabama. But many of his critics feel Wallace has not been in control of the governor's office his last term. That's partially true, uh, but that was true before he was ever incapacitated because he's a good administrator. He, don't, he, he sets the principles, he makes the big decisions, and he depends on those around him to carry them out and to make the small decisions and without b bothering him about so many details. Whether he was in full control of the state or not, Wallace was still a power to be reckoned with. His fellow Democrats courted him during the 1984 presidential race. Everyone wanted his support, but he would not publicly give it, although he did have words of advice for Jesse Jackson. I would advise you uh, in, in your running uh, is that you do obey to the extent possible the Secret Service agents. He said I did not. That was my mistake. For 14 years, Wallace has been living in constant pain because of that mistake. By last summer, the pain had become so unbearable, he traveled to Denver for a new and radical operation that hoped to ease the pain. Well, it relieved the a muscle spout in my right leg at night, but uh, I still have quite a bit of pain. I have it now. I'm talking to you, but 
Uh, I'm just trying to ride it out and do the best I can. It's a very radical operation. I don't think I would uh, take another one though like that. Because of his deteriorating health, he realized fairly soon after his 1982 inauguration that this would be his last political office. Subconsciously, I decided uh, maybe a couple of years ago because I knew that each year I got a little weaker and weaker as a result of the shoot shooting. And as the time passed, of course, no calcium goes below where I was shot. And therefore, your vertebrae become very, very brittle. And as a consequence, I knew that I could not make the trip that a governor ought to make. And I subconsciously said it would not be fair to run and ask people to elect me a fifth time when I knew that within that term, the time would come when I would not be able to give all of my physical faculties to the state of Alabama. Looking back, is there anything you would have done as governor differently? Oh, many things, many things I would have done differently. Uh, I'm human, I made many mistakes. Uh, the stay in the schoolhouse door was, uh, was a bad public relations stunt for me and maybe the state. But Whether it was a bad public relations stunt or not, it's an image that won't go away. When the Democratic Party generally speaking, has always been vaguely embarrassed about George Wallace. Uh, treats him with respect because of his injury, because of the assassination attempt, um, but is vaguely embarrassed about the fact that, that Wallace uh, was not just a candidate who, who used race in his campaigns, but who was a candidate who was anti-Washington and anti-government, anti-American government, in a crude sort of sneering fashion. And uh, the party I think we'll always be embarrassed slightly of George Wallace. How would Wallace like to be remembered? I don't know what history will think about one governor of one state. I do feel in Alabama, uh, during the next few decades, I will be remembered for educational progress in the state. And also, I hope that I will be uh, looked on as one who laid the predicate for a southerner to be elected president. He wanted to uh, um, establish and in the minds of the Alabamians that we were equal to or better than the other people in the country. Now he said it in a very trite country way, but he got through that we didn't have to hang our head to anyone. Don't know what'll happen to George Wallace, but I think he'll go down in, in Alabama history uh, as, uh, as a man who uh, probably uh, uh, one way or other roughshod pushed us into this century. <laughs> There'll never be another George Wallace, though. So.